Gnosticism, and you've already heard that the father of all Gnosticism is uh, one interesting individual that appears in the Bible only once in a Bible record. And uh, somehow that the awareness of this of this individual has seems to be slipping or has slipped out of the awareness of, of general Christianity. But uh, as you know, I believe that Christians, true Christians, should be should be educated well and educated in the most important things when it comes to biblical history. Usually when I speak about it, I refer to the House of Israel, of course, because I think it's the pivotal doctrine. If we don't understand the uh, identity of the House of Israel and the role of Israel in the since salvation that God is carrying out for all humankind, then we cannot really understand the Bible itself. We cannot even understand the uh, the prophecies either, and we cannot really understand even the, the holidays uh, that God commanded his people to keep, and he commands all the peoples to keep it anyway. But um, uh, again, uh, among those things from the Bible history, there are certain things from the New Testament history that also... Uh, uh, we seem to be missing and uh, the New Testament does contain very important lessons for us. So I feel that I should be uh, giving you today on this Sabbath reminder or warning or education or whatever you want to call it, however you want to call it, related to this individual. That individual is called Simon Magus. Simon Magus. Thankfully, uh, from the ambassador University of Ambassador College materials, I was able to uh, save various things that are very useful for us and we can use from, so when it comes to the church history, there was one paper written in 1976 by an individual called uh, Keith Cottrell, obviously it was written for a class, and in that paper he summarizes some very important things about Simon Magus in a very good way. Uh, uh, pointing out the most important things. Uh, perhaps when it comes to Simon Magus, I've got even more information. So perhaps, and I've got another work, even more, uh, even larger study about Simon Magus and his life. And because this individual is so important, I feel that perhaps we could have several messages on him. Because brethren, one of these things that he was expert in was also to do and perform false miracles. Uh, and in fact, when you read about the historical record and how he did it, you might get an idea how the coming European dictator, the uh, son of man, son of perdition, uh, who is prophesied in Second Thessalonians, is, may use for various false miracles, miracles that would be inspired by Satan, certainly not by God. Uh, we also know that at the end of the of the time there will be a false prophet as well, uh, somebody who will be a pope at that time. Uh, some people speculate it might be this one. Well, brethren, I've seen, I watched, I spied on the Vatican on their <laughs> on their horrendous uh, uh, midnight mass at Christmas. I do it every year because I'm always amazed at the pomp and all of those all of those rituals that God calls abomination in his word, and uh, I always want to see those abominations in action, how they look like, and why does God call them abominations anyway? And so therefore, this current Pope seems to be very exhausted. He couldn't even walk. He was p pushed in the wheel in a wheelchair. Uh, this doll, that kind of wooden doll that kind of represents Jesus Christ, he couldn't even stand and take it with his own hands. Somebody... Somebody took it out of that manger and gave it to him and so on. So uh, he looks very exhausted. He looks, uh, he might be very sick, very ill. And therefore, perhaps we can expect somebody else to come and succeed very soon. As you remember, probably you've heard this, this news from this week that the, the previous Pope, uh, Pope Emeritus Joseph Ratzinger died. You could have seen all those masses of people worshipping their, their Pope, their father, because they consider him to be the, the son of God on the earth and so on. You could have seen the transparency in, uh, transparency and, 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 uh, placards in German. Thank you, Pope, you know, Ratzinger, whatever. Even though we know that the previous Pope Ratzinger was part of the Nazi movement, he was in the Hitler Jugend, Hitler Youth movement, Hitler Jugend anyway. But nothing surprising when it comes to Vatican. However, many people have no idea what is the origin of Vatican. <laughs> Many people have no clue that the current uh, rituals, uh, activities of Vatican are just the uh, 
incarnation of the pagan religion of Babylon, my dear friends. People have even no clue who founded the Vatican, of course. <laughs> so they're so clueless, but we are God's people, and of all the people we should know that. And thankfully, again, enough enough of the good material has been preserved for our studies. So uh, if you go to Acts chapter 8, we find there the only account in the Bible of a man called Simon, or Simon Magus. Uh, and this is a very important personality, because he even got baptized, <laughs> interestingly enough. Then he was unable to purchase apostleship. He left the church and uh, founded the Universal Pagan Church, which exists, has existed, has been existing to these days, and is still alive, alive and kicking there in Rome. Acts yes, chapter 8, uh, we'll start with verse 4. Therefore they were scattered, speaking of the apostles, abroad. They, they were scattered abroad, went everywhere preaching the word. Interesting, of course, just like we do today with the gospel. Verse 5, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Messiah unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those, unto these, those things which Philip spoke. So they obviously began to believe the true Messiah. Now this is very significant, brethren, because the Samaritan people had a falsified Old Testament religion. They dumped themselves the people of God. They mixed, uh, they had a kind of terribly pagan religion anyway. They proclaimed themselves the uh, descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They even falsified, made a false false Pentateuch, uh, the first five books of, of, of the Bible, in, in, in the Bible canon. And that's why Ezra, at the end of his life, uh, Ezra actually had to canonize the Old Testament completely with uh, a, new, uh, a new and very specific kind of uh, letters, and with a stamp of approval uh, at the end of each book so that readers that might come across that scroll would know that it's approved and it's really God-inspired because, you know, uh, as I said, Samaritans were falsifying true religion of the Old Testament. Just like they're doing the same today, the, the modern Samaritans are falsifying, you know, the religion, true religion of the New Testament. Nothing has changed, you see. Nothing new under the heaven, as it says in the book of, so in the book of Solomon's Proverbs. So in any cow, uh, this is important because uh, Samaritans, being so staunch, staunch pagans, uh, did hear the word about the true Messiah, who was the true Messiah, and some of them repented, you see. And it says that the people who were accord gave heed unto those things which Philly spoke, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Oh, that's what really intrigued Simon Magus. Verse 7, For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with pulses, and that were lame, were healed, and there was great joy in that city. But there was a certain man, verse 9, called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one to whom they all gave heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of Elohim. Elohim is one of the, and the first name of God that appears in the Bible, as you know. Elohim, it does imply that God is a family, that God is a family of uh, divine beings. Currently, we have only two members of that divine family, Jesus Christ and God the Father. But the family is open up for many more Christians to come and be born again at Christ's return, so the family will... Uh, increase very dramatically uh, at the first resurrection as pictured to us by the day of Pentecost. Uh, verse 11, And to him they had regard to Simon Magus, because that for uh, that of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries, but when they, when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of Yahweh, as it says in some translation of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus the Messiah, they were baptized, both men and women. And then what happened, verse 13, Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of Elohim, they sent unto them Peter and John. Of course, one of those pillars of the church. You know, it was not a small... It was a small event, brethren, a very pagan nation, 
received, you know, received uh, Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Because they always said they're false messiah. Of course, you can just uh, you can just presume who was this false messiah. Well, here it is, <laughs> Simon Magus. You see, he bewitched the people. He presenting himself as God himself, brethren. And he stated he was he was amazed. You know, he was amazed because uh, he was amazed by the miracles that those people did without uh, powers of demons. Now, when the apostles in Jerusalem, that's verse 14, where Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of Elohim, they said unto them, Peter and John, who, when they were down, prayed for them, and that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for as yet he was fallen, he uh, was fallen upon none of them, meaning it was fallen, the Holy Spirit not, didn't fall yet on all of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Master Jesus. Uh, so they were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, as you know, but then the laying on of hands obviously didn't happen. And then Peter and John came and prayed for them and, 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 and laid their hands on them. Verse 17, then laid they their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through laying on of hands, of the apostles' hands, this Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, give me also this power that on whosoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said unto him, and this is the prophecy, brethren. Brethren, this is a prophecy. This is one of the most important prophecies in the Bible. Please mark this, know that, and remember this. But Peter said unto him, that Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of, of, of God may be purchased with money. You have, verse 21, You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this your wickedness, and pray to God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I perceive, verse 23, please mark it, for I perceive that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And what is iniquity, brethren? It's lawlessness. I perceive that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity, brethren. That is a That was a prophecy, and today it is also prophecy, brethren. Prophecy in the New Testament, yes. Yes, we need to know it. Prophecy about the father of Gnosticism, about the father of heresies, as he is called, Simon Magus. For I perceive, uh, then answered Simon, verse 24, and said, Pray you to God for me that none of these things which you have spoken come upon me. And they, when they had testified and preached the word of God, returned to Jerusalem and preached the good news in many villages of the Samaritans. You know, as they went to Jerusalem, they just preached many villages. You may wonder, what is this? Uh, translation, well, back in 2012, there was Restoration Study Bible, King James Version, second edition, in the year 2012. And I've just read from that version, I'll continue to read from it, because it's kind of interesting, intriguing, to you it's new, and uh, it's very clear when it comes to English translations. Now, this short account tells us a great deal about Simon, by, but by researching history, we find even much more, and for the next Sabbath we might have a whole series uh, on him about historical data, when he was born, what he was doing and stuff. Because, brethren, it is important to you, for you to understand we have this continuation of the Babylonian mystery religion. It started with, 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 with ancient Nimrod, with ancient Nimrod in Babylon and his wife Semiramis, his mother wife Semiramis. That very religion, brethren, later we find in uh, the book of Numbers when Balaam, Balaam, was asked to curse Israel. Balaam was the Balaam was the high priest of all the pagan world of that time. And Balaam, of course, could not curse Israel. He he simply <laughs> could only bless Israel. But anyway, Balaam was the uh, representative of the Babylonian mystery religion. Then we come to these New Testament times, and here we have Samaria and Simon Magus. He was now the representative who continued the Babylonian mystery religion. Then later he moved from Samaria to Rome, where he brought all of those sorceries. He was worshipped as God. And he, brethren, founded the universal pagan church, to which he gave the Christian name, and which he uh, covered with uh, only with so-called Christian customs, just like... Just like Simon Magus, of course, led by Satan, and it's always Satan that was Satan's plot to basically subvert Christianity, true Christianity, and give it, give it, give it, give it the name 
subverted with pagan customs and pagan ways, but still call it Christianity, which is terrible. Now, you may wonder why Simon is mentioned by Luke here in Acts, and you may begin, you know, to ask several questions which are very relevant. Who was this Simon, when, and where did he live? What was his education? What was his background? What did he do? What were his beliefs? Where did he go after he met Peter? And does he have any influence on history? And if so, did that, did he affect religious history? The answer to all of that, Brandon, is yes. Because I've just pointed out to you that we have here in Acts chapter 8 and in verse 23, we have the prophecy, prophecy, it's not very clear from this translation or any translation in English, but it's clear from the context in Greek that we can read it. So I perceive that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity, that you are overpowered by sins or by lawlessness. Anyway, brethren. So, uh, Simon was a Samaritan. He lived in the city of Gilta. He was known as Simon Magus because of the magic he performed. Ma- 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 Magus, M-A-G-U-S, Magus, Magus meaning magic or magician. Simon was a sorcerer because he bewitched the people of Samaria. He was a priest in the religious system of Samaria. You see, and he was this continuation of the ancient Babylonian religion. And then later we see his followers that infiltrated themselves into the church. We see later about them, brethren. We see them in the book of Revelation, in chapters 2 and 3, they are described. Those who basically are Simonites, they are described as a synagogue of Satan. And they were constantly opposing in all the ages, in all years, they were constantly opposing true Christianity, brethren. That is the case even today. Nothing has changed, you know. So, uh, Magus meaning magician or magic, and Simon was a sorcerer. He bewitched the people of Samaria, and he was the priest in Samaria. Now, you might remember that the ten tribes of Israel were taken captive by the Assyrians around 700 before Christ. And then when they were taken captive, taken to other lands, other people were imported into the land. And these new people were from Babylon. It's very clearly in Second Kings chapter 17, verse 24, they were from Babylon. In fact, five tribes of Babylon. And they did not know the true eternal God. So they continued in the customs and practices of their former mystery religion. Now their priests were practicing many magical rites. However, brethren, these people soon had problem with the lions. We know about that in the Bible. Because God sent those lions. And assuming it was because they didn't know the God of the land, they asked the king of Assyria to send back some of the former priests of the land. And of course, <laughs> those priests of the land were just paganized Israelites who just uh, contaminated the true religion with paganism. But one of them was sent to the land and the people began to combine the Babylonians' religion with pagan religion of the Israelites. And you read about that in Second Kings, Kings chapter 17, verse 26 through verse 35. Now, uh, why did I say pagan religion of the Israelites? Because, brethren, in several hundred years of years earlier, the northern tribes of Israel departed from serving the true God of Israel. They no longer kept the Sabbath but Sunday, and they worshipped idols. And with the combination of these two religions... The people of Samaria knew about God eternal and the law, but they did not know, they did not know God. They knew about Him, but they didn't know Him. They did not honor nor worship the true God. They also practiced the mysterious and heathen parts of the Babylonian religions. Now this was the type of religious environment in which Simon Smeger was born, and of course, it was about the same time that Jesus Christ Himself was born. Simon Magus was educated in Alexandria and was schooled in the art of magic and of sorcery. We read about that from History of Christian Religion to the year 200 by Charles B. White, published in Chicago in 1881, page 105. And many sources of history relate that he had a theory that all power comes from fire. By studying the history of magic, we find that the Magi 
uh, a group of skilled magicians knew about electricity and could control it to a certain extent for their own desires, you see. And it is certain that the Magi were not only familiar with electricity, but were able to generate and direct it in ways that are now unknown. They also knew the art of producing and controlling controlling lightning. Now, why am I saying this is important? Well, because obviously they could make, or the, the, the coming European beast can make all kinds of false miracles, which people who do not know the Bible and they don't know that the miracles can also be false and inspired by Satan, those people will probably be totally unaware of what is going on. They'll be worshipping the, worshipping the first beast, the European dictator, and, uh, and they will not be able to discern what is truth and what is lie. Now, I mentioned already that, uh, let's see, let's review it once again. Simon Magus, being skilled in magic and sorcery, he was, he also was, he knew the power of fire, so he soon began, became the high priest of Samaria, in Samaria, and he bewitched the citizens of Samaria. The Bible tells us they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God, and to him they had regards, because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. This is in Acts chapter 8, verse 10 and 11. Now this lets us know that all of the people of Samaria called him the great power of God. It also indicates that he had been there for some time. Now with this background in mind, we see Philip come onto the scene. Simon saw wonders performed that he himself could not do. He was amazed, especially when the people began turning from him and following the new teachings of Christianity. In Acts chapter 8 verse 13 it says that Simon Simon also believed. Well sure he believed, brethren, who wouldn't when they saw such great signs. But he didn't really repent or accept Jesus Christ. He saw two things, you know. One, his power over the people slipping away. And second, the opportunity to learn new magical tricks. And when he saw the power that Peter and John had and could give out by laying on of hands. Oh wow, his moment of truth came. He offered them money so that he might also have power. This is also mentioned in the church in the New Testament period by Adolf Schlachter. Uh, it was published in London in 1971, page 91 and 92. Now, the Apostle Peter became very upset, of course, and rebuked Simon. He also made a prophecy against him, for I perceive that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. That's Acts 8, verse 23. Now, this verse has been misunderstood because the King James Version fails to give the full force of Peter's accusation, brethren. This verse, when understood in the manner Peter intended, is one of the most important of the whole chapter and even, I would say, even of the whole Bible. It is a prophecy. Peter knew the mind of this man and what this man was to become. This is made plain by Sir William Ramsey in Picture of the Apostolic Church, page 60, where William Ramsey says, Peter rebuked him in strong and prophetic terms. The prophecy is concealed in the ordinary translation. The Greek means thou are for a goal and a fetter of unrighteousness. In effect, your cause of bitterness and corruption to others. So Simon Magus was going to do corruption and bitterness. He was going to introduce that into the, into the church of Christ, church that Christ founded into the church of God. And then he was going to prevail with that brethren. And then as I told you, that church kicked out the small remnant of faithful ones. And uh, it just went its own way. And uh, the true believers continued in their own way. So Peter uttered a prophecy. Peter was uttering a prophecy by the Holy Spirit. And he was telling what this Simon was to become. The Bible shows us that Simon at that time, at this time, did not repent, but asked for repentance. In other words, he asked for that prayer be made, that this would not happen to him, which Peter spoke. But he repented not of his evil. Simon believed that he deserved to be an apostle. Since he couldn't buy an office, he just assumed 
one after the apostles left. After all, you know, he was a priest and he had been baptized, brethren, into true church, baptized, so he simply adopted some of the Christian concepts. Now you have acquired a hodgepodge of religious beliefs. This is what he took to Rome a few years later. Now we are told by Justin Martyr, who was uh, from the same area as was Simon Magus, Justin Martyr tells us that Simon came to Rome in the days of Claudius Caesar in 45 AD and made such an impression by his magical powers that he was honored as a god. We are also told that a statue was erected to him on the Tiber rivers between uh, two bridges. Now just why he went to Rome, that seems to be unknown. Well, one source of information indicates that the converted Samaritans withdrew their support and contributions and being close to the end of his resources, he purchased a female slave and undertook pilgrimages like the apostles. He showed his wonders to those willing to worship him and doubtless also to pay him. Now, uh, we read about all of that in the history of magic from Eliphaz Levy, published in Philadelphia, uh, and it's on page 183. So, finding his way to Rome, Simon Magus enjoyed much popularity with his magic tricks. My cat is, my cat is being excited for whatever reason. Well, don't, don't blame them. We have had, we had fireworks and firecrackers last night and there is still tension in the air because of this Christmas, Orthodox Christmas. And so they're very upset and, uh, and very restless anyway. So he couldn't buy the office, you know. But the Bible shows us that Simon at this time did not repent. He asked for repentance. He believed he deserved to be an apostle. He couldn't buy an office. He just assumed one <laughs> when the apostles left. You know, he was a priest after all. Now he was bap- he had been baptized. So uh, he simply adopted some of the Christian concepts. Now, of course, there's quite a hodgepodge of religious beliefs, and this is what he took to Rome a few years later. Justin Martyr now objected to what Rome, uh, the honor that Rome gave to Simon Magus, because he made impression by his magical powers, and he was honored as a god. And we are also told by Justin Martyr that a statue was erected to Simon Magus on the Tiber River's river between two bridges. Now, why did he go to Rome? We can speculate. But again, you know, there's indication, as I said, that uh, people were withdrawing their support. There were many Christian converts in Samaria, so the preaching of the gospel made a deep impression on a pagan nation like that. So there were many, there were many of those who were, who accepted the uh, Jesus Christ through Messiah. They were turning their back on him. Uh, and now what he could do is uh, he needed some 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 more support of course and uh, you know being close to the end of the his resources what he did he purchased a female slave and then he took an, uh, undertook pilgrimages like the apostles and he showed his wonders to those willing to worship him and doubtless also pay him as I mentioned that's uh, mentioned in the history of magic from Eliphas Levy I already mentioned that source just to remind you and um, what happens then is that Simon enjoyed much popularity and we find in the time of Claudius Justin Martyr informs us uh, in the time of Claudius it was illegal to erect a statue to any man as a god unless the emperor himself had given permission and the senate, Roman senate approved it that's in the dictionary of the apostolic church wrote by James Hastings, volume 2, page 496. And there is much legend about what all Simon did at Rome, and therefore I cannot really, uh, you know, go into that, at least not today. But uh, it's interesting what were his beliefs and teachings. The main theme was that there was a supreme power and a corresponding feminine power, of course, he was that power, this power. So he set himself as the great real liberator and true Christ. 
and he said that he had appeared as the Son in Judea, as the Father in Samaria, and as the Holy Ghost among the nations. <laughs> Interesting, isn't it? But that under these or other names, he was all, he always fulfilled the same mission, which was to set free the idea from the fetters of the body. This Simon promised salvation to all who should believe in him and call upon his name. We are informed about this from the early years of Christianity, from E.D. Presence, and uh, his book was published in New York in 1870, Volume 1, page 321-322. And so, uh, Simon promised salvation to all who would believe in him and call upon his name. Brethren, look, see, you can just see what a falsification of the true religion we only know that it says in the Bible, those who call upon true God, the same will be saved. And all of this was evidently an imitation of the true gospel story that he did. His idea was to actually blend together the Babylonian teachings with some of the teachings of Jesus Christ, especially that he took the name of Jesus Christ and thus created you know, one universal church. The word Catholicus means universal. In the Orthodox world, uh, they have their own uh, patriarchs. But they uh, they call them uh, they call them all uh, well they literally all cosmos or or all all space you know all space patriarchs amazing amazing the the the, the uh, some of the audacity of the nominal Christianity is pretty amazing but obviously they don't know they're here now they're celebrating the birth of the Messiah but they have no idea that the Messiah does not accept that kind of worship and honor and he does not accept the the overall nominal Christianity which is basically totally opposed to the truth and totally opposed to God of, or God of Israel to God of the Bible anyway and so as I said what Simon Magus did, he just blended together Babylonian teachings, some teachings of Jesus Christ, he especially took the name of Christ, of course, and thus he created one universal church. Now, one of the greatest authorities in uh, religious history is Harnack, Adolf Harnack, and uh, Adolf Harnack, I'm going to read uh, 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 an excerpt from him. Harnack, a church historian, states that Simon Magus proclaimed a doctrine in which the Jewish faith was strangely and grotesquely mixed with Babylonian myths together with some Greek traditions. The mysteries worship contributed to gain adherence to Simon. Now, you see, in order to legitimately introduce this paganism into the church, Simon had to explain away many of the Old Testament passages, so he soon just about, you know, uh, he soon just about voided the new, the Old Testament. Because te he was teaching that the doctrines of the Old Testament were meant to enslave people. I don't know where did he get it from, but obviously he got it from somewhere. This spirit that, you know, doctrines, uh, uh, were, uh, the doctrines of the Old Testament were meant to enslave people. That kind of idea continues even to this day in the Protestant world which hates God's law and thinks it enslaves people. Now Simon thought that since he was the eternal eternal God, he could change the scriptures to fit the times, you know. And this was Brethren Satan's attempt to smother Yahweh's true religion with a counterfeit that to the untrained eye looks genuine. He did this principally through Simon Magus, Whose title was also Pater, meaning meaning God. This this noise that you're hearing, please don't worry. It's not a war. Is the uh, is the local population celebration of the supposed birth of Jesus Christ anyway? Uh, and this is only a small portion of what you can hear. If you were here uh, last night around midnight, you could have heard uh, even much worse. Anyway, now. In order to legitimately introduce this paganism into the church, Simon had to explain away many of the Old Testament passages. So as soon as he avoided the Old Testament by teaching that his doctrines were meant to enslave people, 
Simon thought thought that since he was the eternal God, the eternal Elohim, he could change the scriptures to fit the times. And the one commentator uh, basically Ernest L. Martin a Peter was in Rome 2000 years before Christ he published this article on July 96 on page 18 in the plain truth so Simon Magus proceeded to make mysterious religion and uh, universal religion universal mysterious religion and uh, all of this that I've just mentioned evidently was an imitation of the true gospel history because his idea again was to blend Babylonian teachings with some of the teachings of Jesus Christ especially he took the name of Jesus Christ and thus he uh, it was his idea to create one universal church now the famous Harna historian states that Simon Magus proclaimed a doctrine in which the Jewish faith was strangely and grotesquely mixed with Babylonian myths together with some Greek additions. And the mysterious worship contributed to gain, of course, the adherence of Simon because that kind of worship and that kind of preaching was very acceptable for the uh, loose, pagan, unconverted masses anyway. And... Uh, that seems to be the case to this very day anyway. Now, in order to legitimately introduce this paganism into the church, Simon had to explain away many of the Old Testament passages, and in fact, he soon just about voided the Old Testament by teaching that its doc doctrines were meant to enslave people. Simon thought that since he was the eternal, Elo uh, eternal Elohim, eternal God, he thought he could change the scripture scriptures to fit the times <laughs> and this was of course Satan's attempt to smother God's true religion with a counterfeit that to the untrained eye looks genuine you know he did this principally through Simon Magus Potter who amalgamated all the pagan religions into one universal uh, religion and called the system you know Christianity so uh that's that's not a, that's not the irony. Now, with all of this in mind, we can rather easily see that this Simon Magus was an influential person, and he made, of course, a religious history. Uh, his influence is still strong today in the Universal Catholic Church. Many in history refer to him as the father of heresy. As we've already seen, Simon Magus traveled around displaying his magic and attracting followers. So we can, you know, easily assume that since he had a large group of followers back in Samaria and probably family, that he on occasion went back to that part of the world. Because this will strengthen his position in Rome and it will help firmly establish one universal church and uh, would further the belief that the Old Testament was done away with. Nothing new under heaven, the Old Testament being done away with, we hear that already from various Protestant churches, including the other big churches as well. So with any trips he may might make away from Rome, the real truth about Christianity would be further confused. Now we do know that he developed a large following, and it's supposed by history that he established at least one school, you may wonder why school. Well, he, uh, you know, he would, at that school, he would, he intended to train others in the art of magic and ritual rites. So, we come to, uh, the fact that the religion of Simon Magus was a compromise between the true religion and compromise you know, with uh, uh, a compromise with uh, paganism, pagan rites, pagan images. And the Dictionary of Religion and Ethics had to say this about Simon. Simon taught that the precepts of the law and the prophets were inspired by angels, lesser angels of course, lesser beings, in the desire to reduce man to slavery, 
But those who believed in him in Helen, since they were delivered from the sin and ty- tyranny of the law, they were free to act as they would. For men are saved by grace, not by good works. In any case, now going, going on to another source, we read that what he, Simon, promised, he promised that the world should be dissolved and that those who were his own should be redeemed. And according to his priests, Irenaeus tells us, yes, Simon established a priesthood, you see, and uh, tells us that he had lascivious, lascivious lives, used magic and incantation, and uh, incantation, you know, and he made filters and family spirits by whose aid they were able to trouble him with dreams, those whom they may want, him and all the others. Next go, we can get the next part. They had images of Simon and Helena in the form, in forms respectively of Jupiter and Maria. So this is from the uh, Dictionary of Christian Bibliography, volume 4, page 6, 8, 3. Now with the incorporation of images and incorporation you know, of images and all idols into what is a Christian really religionity, we can really understand that why the true converts resorted to idolatry and to purification and other sins. We then find Paul, Paul had a, to continually admonish people, asking, asking him, you know, he was admonishing people to live upright and uh, deceive life uh, and deceive well to live upright and decent lives you know people were just being being basically admonished that by Paul now we don't know how much about the death of Simon we don't know too much about the death of Simon Simon Magus you see some say that he or she as it happened he as it happened happened here that various apostles were killed and basically buried in, uh, buried in, 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 you know, various cemeteries. And some of those cemeteries, of course, were pagan. Now, think about it. Could the Apostle Peter ever visited Rome and be buried in pagan cemeteries? Jewish people were buried in their Jewish cemeteries, even in those old days. But you see, Simon, he, Magus, he promised that the world should be dissolved and that those who were his own should be redeemed. And according to his priests, Irenaeus tells us that, you know, you see he had the priesthood, that Irenaeus tells us that he led lascivious lives, used magic, and in the incantation, uh, made filters, had familiar spirits by whose aid they were able to trouble the dreams, those whom they would. And uh, here is the next part. They had images of Simon and Helena in the forms represented respectively of Jupiter and Minerva, writes the Dictionary of Christian Biography, Volume 4, page 683. Now, you see, with the incorporation brethren of the images and idols into what is a was now so-called Christian religion, we can understand why the true converts resorted to idolatry and to fornication and other sins. We find that Paul had to continually admonish his to admonish his audience to admonish the people to live upright and decent lives. You see. Now, we have no idea how much uh, about the death of Simon Magus. Some say that he on his own request, was buried alive in Samaria to prove that he could rise from the dead. He was supposed to stay down then for three days and three nights, which would be parallel to Jesus Christ. However, as the legend goes, he didn't make it and died in his own grave. Now, from other sources, of course, we read that a magical act of decapitation where he was supposed to be to at, uh, at least... Uh, 
second substitute the head of a ram and not his own failed now of course you can see that if a trick of that sort did fail he would have been killed a favorite legend has it that he had a meeting with the apostle Peter in front of Nero the Roman Emperor Nero as they were arguing Simon claimed he would fly to heaven and literally began flying around when he when he would come back, they would literally, he would literally uh, be flying around the room at which time Peter played Simon's uh, and Simon came chase, crashing down. Now he died later from this fall, of course. However, we do not know how or when Simon Magus died. The earlier records though say that he was buried in Rome after a long period of great honor and deification. He was not be he was unable to be buried in Rome, brethren. Uh, so it had to be some kind of manipulation. Manipulation was you know that well, there are various possibilities, let's not get into those manipulations anyway. But it is not clear where he was buried. However, we do know for a fact that Rome had a special cemetery for all prophets and for all holy men. This was the sacred cemetery on Vatican Hill. And on that sacred cemetery, actually, is rest, rest the, uh, rest the Vatican, uh, all of the Vatican, you know, Vatican buildings and, uh, Vatican policies and, and so on. Now, the word Vaticanus means prophet or soothsayer. Now, uh, anyway, soothsayer is the word Vaticanus, that's what it means. Vaticanus means prophet or soothsayer. And you know, Simon Magus truly really qualified under the heading, because what better place to bury a man who claimed to be God himself and was honored as a God by not only the people of Rome, but even the Emperor and the Senate. And although Simon is now dead and buried, his teachings live on. One must understand, but we must understand as we consider him that we ha we that he has greatly influenced was influenced by Satan, the devil. Now Satan wanted, wanted the uh, truth about about Jesus Christ and true Christianity to be destroyed or watered down, and this is why why Simon Magus had so much popularity. What he taught appealed to the world of, of, you know, to the, well, it was referred, it was appealed to the people he wanted, but people want to be free and loose. And that's exactly what Simon allowed them to be. Now this is also why his teaching lives on. They were popular and Satan was pushing them. Now, how does it all of how does it all, all of it you know so we have now the expansion of that cult you know because he had his uh, female follower but uh, before that uh before that, I have to mention that uh, uh, Simon Magus had so much popularity because Satan wanted the truth about Jesus Christ and true Christianity de destroyed or watered down. This was the man who, you know, there was a man who appeared from appeared from one region and I've just lost the train of my thoughts when it comes to that man but anyway uh, 
Satan wanted the truth about Jesus and took Christianity destroyed or watered down, and this is why Simon Magus had so much popularity. Indeed, it was prophesied, brethren. What he thought appealed to what people wanted, and people want to be fit and loose. Simon, of course, allowed this. Now, this is also why his teaching lived on. Because they were popular. And Satan was pushing those preachers. So, uh, they continue to this day. They were popular, Satan was pushing them. Now, how does all of this affect, you know, us? Well, we see universal church in Rome that still, that still has these teachings and those teachings still has mysteries uh, it has mysterious trees images idol and uh, rejects the bible anyway we have this universal church that developed in Rome. Universal church in Rome still has these same teachings of Simon Magus. He still has mysterious trees, rites and idols and rejects the Bible as the basis of authority. So the Catholic Church, brethren, has had influence on the world ever since he started way back here with Simon Magus. And to this day, the church at Rome has idols and images that the people fall down to kiss and worship. Now, these images are probably of Simon Magus himself and of the <laughs> mentioned Helena. Now, we can now understand why God, through Luke, wrote a whole section about this man. He was never a part of the Church of Jesus Christ, or Christ's Church. He did not. He did have followers, and they... Uh, They've given, you know, a, uh, they've given us a universal religion counterfeit to true Christianity. Well, brethren, in this perhaps introductory remarks about Simon Magus, I just want to sum it up and just to uh, once again underline the most important things about him. Simon Magus was a priest to the Samaritans about the time of Jesus Christ's birth and about the time of Jesus Christ's death. He was born in the city of Gilta, received his education in Alexandria in magic and sorcery. He received much money and honor from all the people of Samaria. He later, well, I wish I was in his place. <laughs> he later incorporated many of the ideas and principles of Christianity into his Babylonian style of religious teachings. Now this is, you know, this he took with him when he moved to Rome and thereupon seeing his powers the people worshipped him you know he became so well known that the Roman Senate voted and created and erected a statue to him if, as if he were God and there or here he thought that he, that he was the supreme power and that there is a corresponding feminine power he proclaimed salvation to all who would believe on him. He did not. He did this by taking the name of Jesus Christ and taking the name of Christianity, of course. How else could he do it anyway? So he did that. He, you know, took the, uh, again, appropriated the name of Jesus Christ. It's probably better, better, better put. And, uh, we can, you know, we can indeed understand that he received much money and honor from all the people of Samaria. He later incorporated many of the ideas and principles of Christianity into his Babylonian style of religious teachings. Anyway, uh, we can understand now why God, through Luke, wrote a whole section about this man. He was never a part of God's church. He did not have followers. 
uh, uh, and no, uh, uh, they have given him, they have given us a universal religion counterfeit to true Christianity. So, what happened to some Omegas in Rome? Well, he just moved to Rome, and thereupon, seeing his powers, the people worshipped him. And he became so well known that the Roman Senate voted to and erected a statue of, of him as if he were God. Now, here he thought that he, he, I mean the deity, was a supreme power and that there was a corresponding feminine power. He proclaimed salvation to all who would believe on him. Did the same, did the same as well by taking the name of Yeshua and named Christianity and applied them to his, his new religion. So his intention was to create one universal church. We see that Helen, Simon, had a great following, following, uh, uh Selen, uh, sorry, uh, anyway, he created a great following, but when he had a great following, that following spread all around the known world. He had a priesthood that helped him do this. Now it's not clear how he died, but one can be reasonably sure that he was burned, of course buried, in Rome on Vatican Hill. You see, he incorporated, as Peter prophesied to him, the worship of idols and images with Christianity, all of which has stayed with the universal church in Rome today. And from all of this, now we see that Simon Magus greatly affected history, and he was the first Pope of Rome. So now we know who is the first Pope of Rome. Well, Enough for, enough for this, for this day. We just have now the most basic information about Simon Magus. We understand what the servant of Satan he was. And we need to be, of course, keeping vigil and, uh, as it says there, pray always. So during that, during night, if we, you know, if we are, uh, if we are able where to beware of various tricks and things and teachings of his church anyway and this he took with him when he moved to Rome and then you know upon seeing his powers the people worship you know his powers the people, the people worship him Simon Magus, brethren. Simon Magus, the supreme power, deception of deception when he moved to Rome. There in Rome, seeing his powers, the people worshipped him, became well known. Even the Roman Senate voted and erected a statue to him as if he were God indeed. He was preaching that he was the supreme power, that there was a corresponding feminine power. He proclaimed salvation to all who would believe on him. He did this by taking again the name of Jesus Christ and the term Christianity and applying them to this new religion that he created. His intention was to create one universal church and we see that he had a great following which became worldwide. He had the priesthood that helped him do this as well. Now it's not clear whether how he died but you know we can reasonably be assured that he was buried in Rome on Vatican Hill. 
because he incorporated the worship of idols and images with Christianity. That was why he was so popular. And all of that, all of which has stayed with the one universal church in Rome, even today. Even today. So from all of this, we see that Simon Magus greatly affected the church and that he was the first pope at Rome. The first Roman pope brethren in history of humankind Simon Magus, the father of Gnosticism, the father of all heresies as well.